the setup, so I appreciate your moving forward as we get more people coming in. <clears throat> I'm Chris Nelson. Uh, I'm the other president of St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland. I actually received my, there it is, the mic was going on nicely. I received my degree from St. John's in Santa Fe, so it's very nice to be home. Uh, I have the privilege of just being the chair, so you won't be hearing any more words from me other than the introduction of our two speakers today, and then I'll, uh, I'll stop us when we need to stop. <clears throat> uh, two of us, uh, Daniel Di Nicola, Di Nicola. Daniel Di Nicola, who's a professor of philosophy at Gettysburg College, will speak first on learning to flourish a philosophical exploration of liberal education, followed by Rex Welsh on the Associate Dean of the College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences, uh, and Professor of Philosophy at the University of Colorado. Mr. D. D. Nicola. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon. Uh, this paper is essentially a distillation of a portion of my recent book that has the same title. And I hesitated about that because it's frankly a risky thing to do when you're contemplating this as chapters become paragraphs. Given the time constraints, of course, one tends to present conclusions fully and to truncate the arguments. And the result can seem either like you're making pronouncements from on high or worse that you're offering intellectual bumper stickers that trivialize, trivialize the complexity of the issues. But I did yield to that concern, and I did in part because uh, it seems quite appropriate for the con conference, not only because, judging from sales of the book, it's unlikely you've read these ideas, <laughs> um, not only because it has a serious discussion of St. John's College, but primarily because it flat out addresses directly the central question of the conference, which is what's the purpose of a liberal education? And it's not exactly as appears in the book because from lecturing about these ideas on other campuses, I have however learned much that's gonna shape these comments. Um, I believe that it is a mistake to present liberal education as a platonic ideal as an archetype of education that is defined essentially by specific curricular content, whether that content is conceived of as works, authors, as a list of essential cultural literacy, or whether it's conceived of as subjects or component disciplines. Neither do I think it's defined by pedagogical methods or distinctive techniques, nor even by institutional type. All these, in fact, have morphed through history in response to intellectual, social, cultural, and technological changes. And so to elevate some particular iteration of liberal education as the ideal is to fail to enjoy the historicity of liberal education, and it's to misunderstand and misdirect both our philosophical and our educational tasks. Rather, what I've proposed is that liberal education should be understood as a tradition of educational theory and practice. Not in the sense of a hoary set of inherited rituals that we must preserve, but as a vital and still evolving tradition in the McIntyre sense. What distinguishes this tradition from others is its supreme aim. The aim, I believe, the purpose of liberal education is the development of a compelling conception of a flourishing life and the cultivation of such a life. In short, liberal education is about the promotion of flourishing lives, and that distinguishes it from other forms of education. The breadth that we commonly associate with liberal education is best understood as a kind of holism, as the sweep of its normative concern the activity of living as a human being, and the view of one's life as a whole. Flourishing, I think, has both subjective and objective markers. I would identify the subjective markers as a general satisfaction with one's life as it is, and an identification with that life. 
The objective markers include the possession of capabilities and goods that conduce to and extend those subjective markers. So flourishing requires also the ability to function with excellence and efficiency in the world and to enjoy the experience of intrinsic value. The account I'm developing is clearly a eudaimonistic account developed within an Aristotelian tradition. But I do not wish to carry all of Aristotle's baggage. Critics of Aristotelianism might claim that I'm smuggling in the notion of the good life, seen plausibly as an aristocratic, hegemonic, sexist, and racist view of what is best, a prescriptive vision that arrogantly assumes the moral and intellectual authority of educators and the righteousness of their efforts. And I reject these misunderstandings of my meaning. I do not mean that developing a conception of the flourishing life requires the apprehension of a pre-existing ideal, nor do I imply that there is a single universal vision of such a life. This goal is an individual achievement, hard won, though it affects and is influenced by others. And the result is a diversity, even a profusion of visions. Moreover, the hard-won understanding of flourishing one achieves will likely evolve with life's passages and later learning. In short, it continues as an infinite task. It is another deep misconception to assume that the quest for a flourishing life, which I identify as the wellspring of liberal education, is an elitist pursuit, that it arises only in situations of privilege and comfort. In fact, profound concern for one's life and human prospects may arise in reflective solitude, amidst crippling poverty, in despair when resplendent ideals of the good life have been shattered, even after great horror. On the other hand, I do accept the Aristotelian principle that a flourishing life implies sources, supports, arenas, and forms of engagement that are communal. Moreover, as he noted, learning to flourish will not guarantee a flourishing life. One success is contingent on luck and other circumstantial factors beyond human control. Nonetheless, adopting such a name will, in fact, govern many aspects of our experience, direct our actions, thereby shape our life and identity, and in short, it's the best game going. Taking seriously the hope of a flourishing life leads immediately to questions about the components of such a life and the best ways to prepare for and cultivate it. And grappling with those large questions leads to other very profound questions. What is the human condition? What are our prospects? Who am I? Who might I become? What's my relationship to others? What can I do in the world? So understanding how we might flourish requires knowledge of what is, of what might be, and of what ought to be. Theorists of liberal education navigating this network of profound questions from different vantage points have developed what I'm calling paradigms. These are comprehensive visions and they set polarities in the philosophy of education. As they are elaborated, they establish subsidiary aims. They generate forms of educational discourse, inspire curricula, and they guide pedagogy. There are, there are or so I have discerned, five historical paradigms of liberal education. They are not ordered in revolutionary succession like Cunian paradigms, rather they are co-present, competing, and sometimes conflicting. Each paradigm privileges certain intellectual skills and virtues. Each proffers a distinctive ideal of the educated person. Each offers a distinctive form of liberation, and each has its own liabilities. Much of the dynamism of the tradition of liberal education is produced by their shifting dominance and blend. They are all in play today. And here are the five paradigms. Liberal education is for the transmission of culture, 
for the absorption of the human experience as encoded in texts. Two, liberal education is for self-actualization, for the identification, actualization, or creation of a normative self. Three, liberal education is for understanding the world, for comprehending the, the facts and the forces that shape our lives. Four, liberal education is for engagement with the world, for active, normative, and effective engagement. And five, liberal education is for the acquisition of the skills of learning and the disposition to use them. After a brief characterization of each, I want to describe their relationships and conclude by how this analysis might clarify our tasks as educators. So let me start with the transmission of culture model, one familiar to good St. John students. Culture is not transmitted genetically. It can be preserved across generations only through learning. This is a great inconvenience. But both cultural content and its transmission were greatly enhanced by the creation of texts, that is, durable objects that encode human experience in symbol systems. The culture paradigm harbors the wisdom that absorbing this precious legacy is the path to a flourishing life, perhaps even a constitutive component of it. More passive interpretations of this paradigm focus solely on the student's acquisition of this heritage. And therefore, they privilege the skills of comprehension, that is, reading and intelligent listening and viewing, attention to detail, proficiency in language, the skills of explication, and so on. More active versions of the paradigm add the need to comment, analyze, critique, and evaluate, perhaps even to join the intertextual conversation, and perhaps contribute text in one own, one's own voice and they privilege those additional requisite skills. Human finitude necessitates some principle of selection. It is not possible to assimilate all texts. But a division of labor and a judicious choice of texts is required. Whether one rejects the label of great works or not, criteria of worthiness under some interpretation must be applied in creating a, a curriculum or even establishing a personal reading list. This paradigm is the one that undergirds Huell's permanent studies, Hutchins' great books, Adler's great ideas, and Oakshot's immortal conversation, and not incidentally the vision of St. John's College. It portrays the liberally educated person as one who is culturally literate, who knows masterworks and a body of literature, who has facility in multiple languages, who in short is a scholar. This sort of study furnishes the mind, its advocates claim. Its pursuit enlivens the intellect and enlarges the moral imagination. It's the best strategy for a flourishing life. It offers the student liberation. Liberation, in this case, from a timeless, meaningless, unconstructed present. From parochial prejudice and narrowness of vision from a simplistic or solipsistic life. Turn to self-actualization. Under this paradigm, liberal education is about the awakening and nurturance of latent capacities and qualities within each student that conduce to a normative self. It is a form of perfectionism. It may exhibit subtle variations that intimate metaphysical differences in the conception of the self. So its aim may be conceived variously as finding or discovering oneself, as self-definition, self-realization, self-actualization, self-formation, or even self-creation. It all begins, of course, with knowing myself. What does one get from a liberal education? One gets oneself transformed. As Pindar once wrote, become who you are. Thus, liberal learning shapes identity. 
Self-actualization offers us liberation from confused and imposed identities, from alienation and inauthenticity, from the disappointment of stifled, untested, or suppressed potential. In a flourishing life, one shapes and achieves one's own most possibilities. The curriculum from this, for this paradigm is derived not from a canon of treasured works, but from the potential and promise of one's students. In its most elaborated form, the self and its potential are individuated. In simpler and more institutionally practicable forms, some more generic notion of the self, of human nature and potential, predominates. But it's nonetheless a view that recognizes, even celebrates, difference and diversity. The desired educational outcomes are suitably particular. It privileges reflection, self-awareness, the willingness to go beyond one's comfort zone. What may seem to be a self-absorption likely gives way in education as education reveals the social and communal dimensions of self-actualization, of dependence on others, and on their self-actualization for one's own flourishing life. An educated person, therefore, is one who is accomplished and authentic, who is continually engaged in the explorations of one's possibilities and who is actualizing their best self. This is the paradigm of Friebel and Montessori, of institutions like Summerhill, and of colleges like Bennington, Hampshire, and Evergreen, at least in their vintage forms. The focus with the third paradigm, understanding the world, moves from the inner life to the outer world. Liberal education is aimed at gain, gaining understanding of the world in which we live and the forces that shape our lives. So the paradigm urges us to grasp the world as it is, on its own terms, and not as a projection of our fears and needs. It is a task that has what philosophers call a mind-to-world direction of fit. Its advocates claim that we cannot attempt to create a flourishing life if we're ignorant of how the world works, of the natural and social forces that shape our lives. From our own bodies to the operations of influential institutions, we face the things of this world with wonder, curiosity and care and observation, respect for evidence, perceptivity in theorizing, and knowledge construction. These are among the virtues and skills this paradigm privileges. Success requires far more than the acquisition of facts, of course. We must learn methods of inquiry and acquire cognitive frameworks, and multiples of these are better than one. The paradigm thus suggests a curriculum that features a breadth of disciplines and seeks their integration. The liberation offered here is a freedom from superstition ignorance and error. And such understanding can have an emotional impact as well, freeing us from reflexive fear and hostility. The vision of the educated person now idealized as a polymath, a person with supple intellect, with broad interest and knowledge in the ways of the world, the disciplines, and with currency in the natural and social sciences. And this is the paradigm of many distribution requirements and nearly all contemporary universities that have a research focus. I might say they're active and passive versions of this too. The passive versions deal with the acquisition of current knowledge and the active versions deal with becoming a researcher, contributing to the understanding of the world. Let's turn to engagement with the world. The fourth paradigm construes liberal education as a preparation for engagement with an action in the world. And historically, the world has been the public domain, not often the domestic, usually with sexist consignments to these domains. But the aim here is personal effectiveness. And so this view idealizes the educated person as a committed and effective agent, one who can act effectively and critically to persuade others to serve and advance worthy causes, to change the world, or to labor in that hope. 
civic engagement, social reform, political activism, public service, cultural critique. These and more activities are anticipated or even embodied in the educational program. Curricular content derives from a knowledge and a critique of the state of the world in light of one's values and aspirations, along with the requisite capacities for personal effectiveness. To become liberally educated, then, is to be liberated from powerlessness, from false constraints and social entropy, from helpless bystanding as the world moves on to gain freedom of agency, the capacity to shape one's will to the fulfillment of one's best judgment, to take a stand on behalf of one's values. This paradigm was exemplified as long ago as Isocrates' Athenian school, but it's also in vintage Antioch College and in the motto of Princeton as Princeton in the nation's service. acquiring the skills of learning. The last paradigm emphasizes the arts of the liberal arts, the artes of artes liberalis, or the technai of technai eleutheriae. Here there's less concern with content, more with the acquisition of transferable skills that are of use in learning anything. Thus an educated person is one who has learned how to learn and who has the disposition to use relevant skills in learning throughout a lifetime. Of course, the relevant skills change with technology, but in today's world, we're likely to focus on reading comprehension, uh, quantitative skills, logical reasoning, information literacy, critical thinking, communication and social skills, and so on. What motivates this paradigm is the recognition that the world is constantly changing, that knowledge is perishable, that memory fades, and that we cannot carry knowledge from the past from the past into the present, or in, even into the future. We can, however, respond by equipping ourselves with the skills to learn whatever might prove to be salient to a flourishing life. Acquisition of these skills holds out the promise of liberation from becoming outmoded, from cognitive entropy, from the ignorance and uselessness that may follow. The student gains the freedom of self-directed learning. Now, I hope I've conveyed these paradigms as quite distinct yet comprehensive and coherent visions of liberal education. Differing in the skills and virtues, they elevate the locus of the curriculum, that is where they draw the curriculum from, their ideals of the educated person and the form of liberation they offer. Each is attractive, even compelling, but thin. They require instantiation what I call a cascade of specificity, so that each can be a fertile matrix to spawn curricula, to influence pedagogy, even to shape whole institutions. Many familiar educational controversies arise out of their competition, but conflicts may also arise within a paradigm, as, for example, disputes over the proper content of the canon within a transmission of culture paradigm, or disputes about the comparative value of different disciplines, in the understanding the world paradigm. And as I said, the tradition of liberal education displays many iterations of theory and practice, practice that reflect their competition and their shifting prominence. But they are not simply competitors. Ultimately, remember, they seek the same end. It's perhaps easy to forget that these paradigms arise from the same supreme purpose the development of a conception of a flourishing life and the cultivation of such a life. They are intertwined. A vigorous champion, for example, of the assimilation of culture through an agonistic encounter with great texts might conclude, as in fact Michael Oakeshott did, by asserting that such study of texts is the pathway to self-actualization. Similarly, advocates of the skills of learning model may ultimately justify their position by the need for such skills in order to engage the world. Beyond this shifting means end relationship, they seem to require each other. The questions of one lead to the questions of the other. How could one engage with the world without understanding it? 
How could one assimilate great works with having, without having the skills of learning? The distinctive liabilities and dangers that each paradigm carries, and I don't have time to talk about their liabilities and dangers, but they are ameliorated by the strengths of others. For example, the temptation to self-absorption of the self-actualization paradigm is corrected by the outward and more objective requirements uh, of explicating text to others or of understanding or engaging the world. The hypnotism of the past, that is perhaps a liability of a life devoted to masterworks, is countered by the future orientation that undergirds efforts to engage, change, or reform the world, and so on. Most institutions today, interestingly, claim a blend of most, if not all, of these five paradigms. They don't claim to offer the five paradigms, but they claim to offer the benefits of the five paradigms integrated in some form. Finally, from this account, I want to claim that liberal education is a deeply moral enterprise, not merely an intellectual one. First, the process of liberal education must meet ethical criteria, such as avoiding indoctrination, valuing the student's integrity. Second, the supreme aim, a flourishing life, incorporates moral virtues and values. A flourishing life is, however, larger in scope than a moral life. It incorporates more values than moral values, but it does incorporate them. Furthermore, it is indirectly moral in, this, in that its success in its subsidiary aims are relevant to and often essential for moral activity and agency under vir virtually every conception of morality that you can imagine. Expanding the moral imagination, knowing how the world works, seeing the larger picture, developing one's capacities, knowing how to learn, having the skills of worldly engagement, how to balance commitment and humility, surely these are components of nearly every version of ethics. An emphasis on objectives and outcomes is meaningful only when our activities, however, remain tethered to our aim. But this brings us back to our last topic, which is our educational task. Our task is not to preserve faithfully a specific ideal of education. It is to engage vigorously in the evolution of a vital tradition. And I want to, want to mention in that regard two additional ways in which I think very important ways that our task connects with moral education. Liberal education reduces the vulnerability of the virtuous. The fragility of goodness remains in educated goodness, but that fragility is better understood and better protected from harm and error. And secondly, an attempt to take moral issues seriously, any attempt to take moral issues seriously, to go beyond merely posing moral questions, but to seek to understand them, inevitably leads to the pursuit or application of liberal learning under these paradigms. Each of us, each institution, each academic department, each faculty carries the responsibility of regularly reinterpreting our vision of liberal education as part of this tradition, of thinking through in light of our world and our students the appropriate blend of these paradigms and the cascade of specificity that they require in practice. Given our intellectual, socioeconomic, and technological context, what must our students learn in order to develop a conception of the flourishing life and to cultivate such a life? How better to celebrate 50 years of distinguished liberal education than with a lively conference that takes up that task? Educational quality for liberal education is determined by the effectiveness of the connection between what we teach and the standard of one's life as a whole. This perpetual task itself reflects and indeed may embody the proce process of crafting and cultivating a flourishing life. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'm a philosophy professor, and as a philosophy professor, I'm, I, I've dedicated my life to uh, a life in the classroom and a, cla a life of reflection. But I'm also a dean, and as a dean, I've dedicated part of my career to utilitarian concerns about running a college and utilitarian defenses of liberal education, in particular, philosophy. I teach and am a dean at a research two institution, a state institution, that's part of a bruising, large, rambunctious system, the University of Colorado. The campus that I teach on is the Colorado Springs campus. It is a campus that is rapidly growing we have 11,000 students on campus. When I started there in 1993, we had 5,000. We are a state institution, so we are watching our support from the state wither and die. All of that is a kind of background um, as a way of saying thank you for having me here. We too, at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, are celebrating our 50th anniversary. But having a conference like this one is unthinkable on our campus, unthinkable. Because we are the campus that is dedicated to providing job training. The liberal arts at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, are under constant bombardment. In my role as a dean, I've taken it upon myself to defend the most abstract of all of them, philosophy. And that's what my talk is about today. I'm going to start with a personal anecdote, and then I'm going to talk about some empirical evidence that suggests that being a philosophy major is a surprisingly good major to, to choose. Then I'm going to analyze the reasons why it's a good major to choose. And then I'm going to end the talk by reflecting on what it is to call somebody philosophical. Why it is that we say of some people, oh, that person's rather philosophical. He's, she's rather philosophical about the whole thing. So that's the arc of the talk. The personal anecdote is this. I was a philosophy major. I dropped out of college after my freshman year. I was a biology major. And I did a lot of different things for four years, most of them revolving around skiing and climbing. And when I went back, I went back as a philosophy major, much to the disappointment of my parents. When I graduated, my parents attended graduation. And they met one of my favorite professors, Don Crosby, who was a Whitehead scholar, among many other things. My dad immediately asked him, well, we're relieved that he finally graduated, um, but philosophy? What on earth is he going to do with that? And Crosby looked at my dad and said, well, among other things, Mr. Welshon, he'll be better off for having been a philosophy major. And that set my dad off. <laughs> he just said, better off? How can that be? He can't make any money with a philosophy degree. And Professor Crosby then said, well, sir, that just shows that there's a distinction between making money and being better off. To this day, my dad remembers that episode. So that's the personal anecdote. We all know that uh, being a philosophy major puts you on the royal road to having a career as a carpenter, a taxi driver, or as a bartender. Now, I happen to like people who do those things a lot, and I've known a few who have made really good livings at those careers. But it's unlikely that they alone are responsible for the surprisingly high mid-career earnings of philosophy majors. A recent survey from a couple of years ago ranked philosophy majors as the 15th most remunerative majors of 50 
that were in the survey. These are average mid-career earnings. Not coming out immediately from college, but in mid-career, philosophy majors do surprisingly well. 15 years down the road, they're on a par with business majors for average earnings. Now, it's true that students who do philosophy rank below the usual suspects, such as engineering and physics. But for information management degrees, international relations degrees, we're on about the same level, about $85,000 a year. And we're ahead of all other business degrees. All nursing degrees, all natural science degrees other than physics, all social science degrees other than economics, all health science degrees, all arts and humanities degrees, and all criminal justice degrees. That's what I want to focus on, why philosophy majors do so well. It's likely that part of the explanation is that the population of philosophy students is a self-selecting set of unusually smart, usually somewhat obsessive, and attractively quirky students. Their combination of intellectual skills and idiosyncrasies drives them to philosophy in the first place and keeps them there long enough to benefit from the discipline's virtues. It's likely, too, that some of those same traits in turn lead philosophy majors forward to make career choices that turn out to be remunerative. And indeed, it's well known that philosophy majors are well represented both in law and medicine which historically, at least, have been among the highest careers out there. But I will say that these lucrative career prospects for a philosophy degree are a little unexpected. I've taught philosophy now for 22 years. And in our department, it's all been at the same department, we disproportionately attract and keep students of four types more than any other. The first are the disillusioned. These are students who come to the university and for one reason or another end up disillusioned about their childhood faith. They immediately gravitate towards philosophy departments where these, uh, these questions are discussed in a respectful way. The second kind of student that we disproportionately attract are the super brainiacs who are double or tripling major. And these are the students who just cannot get enough of academic life. And so they're double majoring in philosophy and physics, or philosophy and math, or philosophy and computer science and math and physics. They just are total gluttons for the academic life. And they do it simply because it's hard, it's difficult, and they like it. Third, we attract a lot of political and social radicals who find in philosophy an intellectual heft to buttress their activist commitments. And finally, we attract a lot of unlost wanderers. And these are the students who are bored with their other majors, the things that they've tried. They have absolutely no interest in conforming to anyone or anything. And they find in philosophy departments a group of other similar misfits. Now, there are other kinds of students who end up as philosophy majors. And sometimes that depends on the department's affiliation with other campus programs. At our institution, for example, uh, in the last few years, our department has attracted a fair number of psychology double majors because the two departments co-host an interdisciplinary center on cognitive science. But now look, consider the, uh, the members of this class. You'll notice that three of the four of them are demonstrably not career-minded. And that the only one that is plausibly career-minded, the Brainiac double or triple major, is only indirectly career-minded. What they really want is just to be working hard. Yet when these students are fed into the crucible of philosophical training, something remarkable emerges. Graduates whose training is about as far removed from job prep as can be imagined but a training that nevertheless provides them a readily transferable skill set 
which makes them promotable in whatever job they land in. So what is it about a philosophy degree that gives you these transferable skills? Obviously, in first, philosophical training is in the great problems of philosophy, the nature of truth, the nature of beauty, the categories of existence, the nature of knowledge, justice, the moral good, and logic. Knowing how to think about these perennial issues helps philosophy students understand others and the world better than most. For among other things, philosophy graduates are quick studies at identifying others' core beliefs, and they know how difficult knowledge acquisition really is. And they are therefore, as a result, more circumspect than others who may tend to be bombastic. But now I want to claim that this knowledge supervenes on something much more important. And what's more, much more important is the dual ability to read and think well. The simple truth is that reading and thinking well are uncommon. They are scarce commodities, and they're goods for employers. Philosophy trains students how to cultivate these skills. Now, the importance of this training cannot be overstated. Last week, I was in LA, and I was on a panel with three very high-powered business people. The president of a video game company, the co-executive of DreamWorks Studios, and the executive of OMD America. OMD is the largest media buyer in the world, and they are the agency behind Apple's ad campaigns. The president of the video game company was not a very interesting person. He wasn't. He was just a kind of alpha business type. He didn't have anything interesting to say. But Stacy Snyder from DreamWorks and Monica Cairo from OMD were subtle, nuanced thinkers. And although they didn't talk like academics, the issues they were interested in were academic issues. The topic of our panel was the commodification of attention. We were talking about how the industry of video games and the entertainment industry tries to turn our human attentive capacities into a commodity for products and to change attention into something that can be a subject to profit motive. We had a two-hour discussion that was fantastic. Towards the end of it, the discussion turned to what Monica and Stacy Snyder value more than anything in the people who they hire. Monica Cairo hires 400 people a year, straight out of college. Stacy Snyder in DreamWorks hires 300 a year, straight out of college. What they both said was that they wanted somebody who has an opinion and can make judgments, who can produce a dispassionate argument in support of their judgments, and who can speak and write clearly and directly. Anybody who teaches in the humanities, anybody who teaches in the arts, anybody who teaches philosophy would like to have a video of that moment and show it to our students because they believe that they're not being served well by being taught how to argue in public. They believe that what they require most is a particular set of skills that they can take to the job. But here are two of the industry's most powerful executives saying what they value most is somebody who can produce an argument on demand. That's a skill that we all, and philosophy in particular, cultivate. In fact, I'm prepared to defend the claim that no other major does this training as directly or as relentlessly as philosophy does. For philosophers work professionally with logic we're professional critics of language, and we're trained to critically assess evidence across any domain we encounter. Such training is provided in most courses indirectly, but in certain courses it's provided directly, in logic, critical thinking, the philosophy of language, theory of knowledge, and philosophy of science. The net result of this training is a kind of cross-training for the intellect. 
made up of very careful reading, clear writing, and careful and critical thinking. Because philosophy majors can both see the big picture and understand the most precise details, because they can question assumptions, analyze arguments, and occupy and understand alternative perspectives without getting lost in them, they always tend to stand out. And because their training is in how to think well both in and outside of the box, they're unusually nimble in dynamic environments in which complex decisions have to be made. And because they've been trained to think well and write clearly about basic questions, philosophy majors are well prepared for talking and working with other humanities types, other scientists, mathematicians, computer scientists, lawyers, marketers, journalists, physicians, policymakers, in fact, anybody who has to think for a living. Not surprisingly, business recognizes the benefits that philosophy majors bring to their enterprises. There have been articles recently in Business Week, Good the Guardian, the London Times, the Times Education Supplement, and the New York Times, all extolling the benefit of being a philosophy major in business. What these articles consistently note is that while businesses have more than enough experts working hard on difficult specific problems, they also reliably need individuals who can connect the dots. Employees who can extract knowledge from a specialist's expert domain without getting trapped in the expert's silo. For that kind of training, a liberal education in general and a philosophic training is tailor-made. But it's not just businesses that benefit when philosophy majors are hired. Graduate programs and professional programs alike welcome philosophy majors because they know that typically they will do very well in their program. Now one measure of this readiness is the performance of students on the so-called entrance exams. This is certainly not the best measure, but it is a measure. If the following isn't already known to this audience, it should be. Philosophy majors consistently score highest of all disciplines on both the GREs and the LSATs verbal reasoning and analytic reasoning writing skills. And they score highest of all non-engineering or natural science majors on the quantitative reasoning sections as well. So that's my data-driven analytic analysis of why philosophy students so well. I'd like to turn next to talking about what it means to be philosophical. <clears throat> I think one of the virtues of philosophical training is that it cultivates within us a type of cognitive pleasure that's enjoyed when we read carefully and exercise our ability to think. This pleasure, and it's a pleasure that's heavily cognitive, is one of the many consequences of a training that insists on self-disciplining the imagination. The imagination, if it's left free to roam on its own, will inevitably fall down one rabbit hole after another, and often with disastrous consequences. If you subject that imagination to some rigorous training, the hope is that you can stay out of all of those rabbit holes. I think that Alfred North Whitehead put this point succinctly. He said that freedom and discipline are the two essentials of education. He said this in his book from 1926 called The Aims of Education. The former freedom is necessary because without it, education reduces to tedious indoctrination. The latter, discipline is necessary because with it, the cognitive power required for the adventure of life can be achieved. When we willingly, and sometimes it has to be admitted painfully, subject our free roaming imagination to the rigor and precision of philosophy, then so long as that training has been well designed, and is executed with care in the classroom. The product is a human mind that has, as Whitehead puts it, an intimate sense for the power, beauty, and structure of ideas. And from that cognitive dexterity emerges a unique cognitive pleasure, 
a delight that we take in the way ideas fit together and fall apart, a delight in the unexpected implications that ideas sometimes have, and in the realization that our cognitive powers are actually greater than we might ever have imagined. Having achieved some level of cognitive competence, a properly trained mind is progressively liberated from the blinders that others want us to wear and the blinders that we all too often put on ourselves. For the curiosity and imagination characteristic of the Aristotelian human being, having been disciplined by philosophical training, those two characteristics, curiosity and imagination, are now free to wander where the trained individual wants them to go. And she may be fully competent, fully confident that her habituated cognitive skillfulness will lead either to a positive outcome or to an opportunity for further reflection and deliberation. Even if reflection and deliberation is the consequence because something awful has happened, it is for the well-trained mind not without consolation. For the reflection and deliberation prompted by a bad outcome is as much a cause for some, albeit different, cognitive pleasures as would have been a good outcome. I believe that it's this kind of puzzling response that marks people off as quote unquote being philosophical. We sometimes use the description to characterize people who are fatalistic, or if that goes too far, for people who are at least atypically restrained in the face of severe misfortune. But so long as we fail to acknowledge that a person who is described by that epithet might have reason not to be completely crushed by hardship, we miss a part of what it is to be philosophical, namely, to have an unquenchable capacity to be surprised and filled with wonder by the world and its inhabitants, even when their antics cause distress. I've called this cognitive power a virtue, and in fact, I think it is a virtue, but it is also something that can be a vice. And it can be a vice, this cognitive pleasure and the skill that lies behind it. It's a vice when it is unleashed as a display on the unsuspecting. I think we've all known people who are logic chopping jerks. And if you haven't met them yet, you're gonna. <laughs> and that kind of display is arrogant and unpleasant. And it's unquestionable that if you take a class in logic, where you learn all of the informal fallacies, tu quo quoi, hasty generalization, ad hominem attack, you can go into any cocktail party and alienate yourself within five minutes. <laughs> so it can be a vice. Even when it remains a virtue, cognitive power and the pleasure taken in it are often baffling to others who know nothing of them. The philosophically trained and philosophically minded person acknowledges both that it can be a vice and that it causes puzzlement in others. We typically try to avoid the former while explaining where appropriate the latter. Some of us become professors and have the opportunity to represent the type while providing elements of the training required to reproduce the type. I suspect that the habituated disposition to dynamic and measured judgment, judgment that's informed by multiple levels of analysis and different perspectives, is part of what my professor Crosby was after when he predicted that I would be better off for having been a philosophy major. Suffice it to say, that's what I took from the training that he and some of my other philosophy professors provided. And it's a significant part of what my own philosophical colleagues and I try to exemplify and in part in the classroom. We frequently fail, as we must, but the great books of philosophy continue to remind us of what has been and what still can be achieved. Thank you very much. See if we get any feedback, because this might work best. Uh, question for the audience. Yes, sir. I have a question for uh, Mr. Walsh on Pauline's book and her. And actually, it's two closely related questions, so you might choose either one of those. <laughs> so, um, what I'm interested in is I think this argument about the ability of philosophy and liberal arts in particular to develop these capacities and skills that can be useful in the market. Powerful. And I 
inspire them. So I was wondering if you could maybe say a little bit too about how you talk to students about these things, or parents of students, and then uh, I'll start, but I won't finish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wisdom is um, knowledge plus a considerable amount of experience plus a certain kind of uh, grace in one's thinking. Grace was in one's thinking. We cannot teach wisdom. I don't, I don't try to teach wisdom. I do try to suggest to my students that other people who are wise have things to say to us. And I try to communicate to the students what these wise people What we can train is the ability to think well, to read well, and to write well. And those are the things that I try to do in every one of my classes. It's hard to persuade parents that those three simple skills are going to carry them a long way. It was hard to convince my father, and it's hard to convince every parent of every philosophy major, except those who were themselves philosophy majors and who know that it's true. But you have to be able to back it up with data. And the data are there. There are, there are good data out there that show that philosophy majors, and in fact, most of the liberal arts do surprisingly well in the business world. Just have a lot of good data. I only add to that that I think the, um, we certainly need to present those data, and we need to be able to talk about value, out, very practical value out in the world for career and also for social benefit from the liberal arts. And I think we have to keep it tethered to the aim of a flourishing life. So a person who is quite accomplished and is performing very highly for a corporation they don't like, for a project whose ethics they, they, they have great reservations about, is not living a flourishing life. They're not identifying with their life as a whole. So when a parent asks me, can my son or daughter get a job um, with philosophy, and the answer is yes. And what's more, philosophy will also tell them when they should leave the job. You know, when they ought to leave it behind, abandon it, and move on, move on to other things. That is a life skill. And um, uh, I too think we can't teach wisdom in this, but one of the problems we're facing I'm taking the problem you asked about and trying to make it an example of this larger problem, which was brought up in the session before, um, is that by definition, it's difficult to explain the value of an education fully to someone who doesn't yet have that education. Unlike medicine, which has a principle of informed consent, education can't have a principle can't be fully informed about what that education is going to do for you. And in some ways, the decision to become educated, to enroll in a particular institution, is irrational. Because uh, if you at least define rationality narrow in terms of rational action as selecting effective means to achieve ends you've chosen and understood, we can't choose those ends if we don't know what they are. So what happens then is we market ourselves and we talk about ourselves in ways that don't represent the truest value. And so we talk about how exciting things are at the institution. We talk about who goes to the institution and the kind of social life that's there. We talk about the amenities. We talk about it. We portray it um, in what the advertisers call image marketing rather than service marketing. And it's because we that question clearly. Yes, sir. Um, so, uh, uh, Mr. Welch, my institution uh, in some respects sounds very, very similar to yours. And, and, and so I'm wondering if you could give a more uh, detailed picture. I'm familiar with the data that you're citing, and, and you know, we put that all over our philosophy web page and, and so forth. Um, I'm wondering, I mean, two different audiences that we get, that we get pushback from. And I'm wondering if, if, if 
persuasive? Is this going to generate additional resources for your department? Um, but I'm also thinking, with respect to potential majors, do you find that they're receptive? In other words, did, did, did bringing this data to their attention, have you found any change in the number of majors that you have? Um, uh, I'll speak to the first question first. It has absolutely no impact on higher level administrators, none whatsoever. Okay. The philosophy department last got a new line at the tenure track level three years ago. It will probably be the last line the philosophy department of my institution gets before 2030, is my guess. The reason that we got the line that we did was not because of any data driven decision making, it was because we had somebody who was doing a bang up job creating a center for religious diversity. And he took the, pro, the then provost to Washington for a lunch at the White House with President Obama's initiative. And so he really did the following. He took the provost on a date and the philosophy department got rewarded with a tenure track position. The truth is that as compelling as some of this data, some of these data really are, upper level administrators at an institution of my kind are not interested in cultivating a philosophy department. They don't understand what philosophy majors do. It's a constant sales job to persuade them that the philosophy major should be supported in some way. And when you think of the bright, shiny objects at an institution of higher education, the new buildings, the new laboratories, the big multi-million dollar grants that a research institution gets, the production of philosophy majors who happen to go to law school, or happen to go into med school, or happen to go here or go there, and have long-term career success, it, it doesn't really appear on their radar. So, no, no real impact. Philosophy majors, on the other hand, big impact. We're at a campus of uh, 10,000, 11,000 students. We have over 100 majors. Half of them are double majors. We, were, we support and encourage them to be double majors. And we do that in a couple of ways. The first way we do it is to make the philosophy degree have relatively few required credit hours. We encourage students to get a broad edu education. And we tell them, as I suggested today, that the reason that you want to be a philosophy major, even if you're a double major in something else, is to learn how to think and write well and read well. That has had a lot of traction on our campus. So, That's not the only thing that drives the philosophy major on our campus. Some of the other majors that philosophy majors typically consider, a psychology major, for example. Psychology on our campus is dominated by a very scientific approach. They do very good work at the cellular level, at the molecular level, even at the systems level, the body, body cells. But that's just not attractive to students who are interested in Freudian analysis or other kinds of cognitive psychology. And so we get some of them going over to philosophy too. Mm -hmm. I have a question. This is a question for you. You talked about uh, liberal arts, sorry, liberal education should be taught as a tradition. It has these nine. or all of those parts, or is there something more than the part? How, I'm just curious about it. Right, right, because it's, it, it's a, uh, what I'm trying to do is to develop a thin theory that is clearly distinctive 
and separates what liberal education has been historically from vocational education, military education, religious education, and so on. But I'm also trying to respect the situatedness of institutional practice and the ways in which these forms have morphed over the years. Anyone studying educational history gets this strong sense of a continuity but great change. Um, so what I do is to say, first of all, let's call it the tradition, not an ideal, because we're not picking any, any instantiation. And by calling it a tradition, I mean to respect that history and to talk about it in a, a, as a continuity. It is a tradition of educational theory and practice. Now, how does it differ from the other traditions of educational theory and practice? It has a different aim. It's defined functionally. Its aim is flourishing lives. Its aim is getting people to cultivate this notion of flourishing lives. And because you find that consistently in the background, if not explicitly, in ancient medieval medicines, um, enlightenment writers, and in a whole range of, of colleges and universities today. So I want to define it functionally, which I think is a sort of Aristotelian way to do it. And then to say, um, but that's very broad. So it has developed these five paradigms at which make it a little more accessible, and from which you can begin to talk about curricula, institutional shape, and so on. Um, if, it is, if it seems too light, too thin, um, I'm a little wary of taking it much further than that. I, I, I mean, I use several examples of the reason for doing this in, in the book. I'll just mention one here that's sort of obvious. Every once in a while, you'll hear an essentialist theorist say something like, oh, you know, I can't believe those people at Brown, all, all the church for Tushan Gettysburg for that matter. Um, those students graduate and they have never encountered Shakespeare. They've never had a course in Shakespeare. Well, when Gettysburg was founded, and if you look at its records from 1832, 1836, there was not any course in Shakespeare. There wasn't any course in anything in English. There wasn't virtually in any college in the country. There was no certainly no American literature, my God. Um, but English literature, no. That was something you did on your on, on your spare time. I mean, there wasn't even British history. Uh, what you took was works that were originally written in Latin and Greek, and usually you read them in the original. There was nothing to do with Latin America, nothing to do with Asia. There were five languages required, but um, they were they they were European languages. It took a long time in the history of education in the United States before Shakespeare became worthy of being taught for credit in a class. But are we going to look at the period before that and say that wasn't liberal education? We just found the liberal education now. So I don't think we can do that. I think we have to keep the theory thin enough and, and, and to define it. But when you do that, it increases the burden on us to develop a viable interpretation of it. So I it's appreciate it. Well, if its aim was, for instance, vocational, where it was a skill or a direct specialized um, preparation for a particular profession, the category that's being used is not one's life as a whole. The category that's being used is professional life, a career, a trade, a skill, Sounds like human flourishing, developing at a really 
Yeah, and there's the same problem with flourishing as there is with liberal education. I want to define flourishing clearly enough. And as I said, I believe it has subjective and objective markers, and also uh, some sort of third party markers about personal effectiveness in the world. But I don't want to define flourishing with such specificity that I undercut the notion that flour flourishing life admits of different interpretations and the issue is to work at finding a compelling interpretation that carries you forward so far, in so far forth, but not lifelong. But could I ask you, just put another yeah. spin on that, uh, and have an exercise of the imagination. What would the curriculum and the college life look like in your ideal, if it's really that kind of combination? What would you do? Well, when I say, First of all, I think that that's all a good question, but it's also a collaborative question. In most contexts, you've got you've got to have lots of different people uh, dealing with it, and it's easy. Uh, I wouldn't want to do it as a blend of paradigms, right? I wouldn't want to say we're under all these five, but I think you need to have. I would need to know what does my institution look like. Who are these students? What are the what are the faculty? If I don't have to worry about that, if no, I can do it, you're, you're going to start. A I'm going to start a college now. Well, that's a, that that leaves me a, a lot to work with because um, and, and I have money. <laughs> oh, gee, I feel better than when I came in. <laughs> I I have money and so on. Well, I think you know personally. I think what's got to happen is you do have somewhat blend of these. I think you end up by having a division of labor within a faculty. And a division of labor is not the same as specialization. I mean, I haven't talked about this section of the book where I talk about threats to this ideal. The threats include things like commodification, certain forms of specialization, not all, but the kind of specialization which prevents people from talking to each other is a problem when you have a holistic ideal. So you want a division of labor, you want people who represent these approaches and for whom that is the primary mode of their teaching. I'm about liberating, I'm about figuring out who you are, what your potential is, and how you, how you liberate it. I'm about, am I interested in texts or are we gonna do it through a text, perhaps? But someone else may say, I'm about the texts. And the texts may liberate you. And in order to do these texts, you have to have skills. So I'm counting on my compatriots, my faculty over here. So what I would have, in short, is not a single person, but a faculty which represented those as priorities in their own teaching, and in which they stayed tethered to the aim. It doesn't have to be present. I'm not saying you put flourishing life on your syllabus. That would, that would be a mistake. But I am saying if that cord is cut, if the faculty as a, as a whole forgets that, then the means become the ends, and you know, we're, we're back at university life. Yes. Yeah, I, I, to follow this one, I, I, I wonder if in order to, to follow this, whether one doesn't need a, a more substantive notion of what a flourishing life is. I mean, for example, you, you, you suggest that maybe it would be more interesting in detail, but you suggest that the five paradigms that you describe, or five paradigms of liberal education that you describe, all aim at a, a flourishing life. And I wonder how, how do we know that? How, how, you know? how do we know that they all do aim at the same end unless we have a more substantive notion of a flourishing life? And I mean, I, I think that in a way, you can know, kind of get away with saying this because Everyone in this room probably does more or less agree with what a flourishing life is, but if you were to make that argument to someone who's more skeptical, right? How how would you make the argument that that these paradigms do all aim at, at something that's the same, um, but without saying any more details of what that is? Because I'm taking the notion of a tradition here, I, the argument is made in the context of both primarily and historical. That is, I'm looking at real examples. So I give exemplars and then critics of every one of the paradigms. Here, here are the exemplars. 
and I might draw them from a wide range of history. Um, and here are the critics of that approach, and then try to show that the criticisms that may be directed at one paradigm are in part at least addressed by the strengths of another paradigm. So my, my answer is, how do you know what, that there are these paradigms? It's probably it's primarily historical and not any of Kantian transcendental deduction categories here. It's also a historical point. Um, then how, and then are, is it possible they're aiming at different notions? Of, well, yes, I think, I, I, I think they have a sense of different pathways. And as I say, I'm not presuming a common notion here of flourishing life. I think that's, um, that gets into the let me tell you what your flourishing life should be as opposed to what we're doing here is we're working to figure out together what is a flourishing life. How might you particularly achieve that? How do you test your life against that? And the other thing is thinking of your life as a category, as a test. How does this affect my life as a whole? Is a big moral jump from, from the kind of decision making that you might do in a business context or, you know, the issue is where will this happen the next quarter? Um, just thinking of my life as a whole is a different category. So if I, would, I would argue it in that, in that say that with the general disillusionment of religion in the 20th century and the 21st century, the presumptions of what comprises a flourishing life have been fragmented. And one of the crucial functions that the liberal arts can still serve is to show how this fragmented notion of a flourishing life can actually be composed over a period of time. So I think those two things are true. The cleverness of Crosby's remark was that he knew that the phrase better off was ambiguous. And he counted on my pecuniary dad's response <laughs> to take it one way, and he provided it the other way. And that kind of skill, whatever kind of skill it is, seems to be a constitutive element of many flourishing lives. I can imagine that there are flourishing lives where that kind of verbal acuity is not part of the flourishing life. It's not a life that I could live, but I imagine that there are such flourishing lives. I have a hard time, you know, I'm actually willing to out on the ledge here, I have a hard time considering or imagining a flourishing life that is completely absent of self-reflection. A life that is uh, characterized by forward activity only without taking any even satisfaction in having accomplished a hard task. If you are prepared to say that um, being satisfied with having done something and finished it is a kind of self-reflection, then I can't imagine a life that's flourishing without some kind of self-reflection, some kind of reflection. So I'd be prepared to say that reflective living is a necessary element to any flourishing life. Now, I'm preaching to the converted here. Um, it gets much more difficult to say that to a bunch of freshmen who don't even understand what it means to live a self-reflective life. 
but that's our job as, as teachers. You know, I think this is a point where we can connect with parents of prospective students because I think that's what they're really wanting from the college experience is somehow for their son or daughter to flourish, to do well, to succeed. And it's a pretty thin theory they have. They don't know what that career might be. They don't know what that, it, it's just this general notion that they should succeed. And of course, if we're, if we're lucky, we can put some flesh on it. Um, and and, and we, can, we can do a better job of it by an institutional context. I, I would only add one thing to this. I'm, I've decided that after working on this book, what I'm working on now is a book on ignorance. I think, um, there's a great danger in a kind of self-satisfied ignorance, even willful ignorance, that I see in the world now. And with the externalizing of a lot of the sense of the self and the means for happiness, that a flourishing life is to have a lot of things, it's to have a lot of resources or something, and that's, that's an impoverished definition. Nonetheless, I think there is a rising trend we ought to be concerned about, about a self-satisfied ignorance. Essentially that I can access the knowledge when I need it, I can buy it if I want it. But the interior life, the reflection that you mentioned, is not part of the sense of a flourishing life. And that's a real tragedy that we uh, should address, certainly philosophy addresses. Yeah, you know, one of the interesting problems when you talk about moral purposes of liberal education is that people see people see that it easily becomes moral elitism. And what you and what they want to celebrate, and I want to celebrate too, and we all know examples of this, is people who have had no liberal education whatsoever, who are in dire circumstances, that you would regard it as simple goodness. They have, and by simple, I don't mean simpleton goodness. I mean, they just, they have purity of heart. They have goodwill. They have, and they're not educated people. So what do you say about that? What is it that your education has? And what I want to say to it is, I think that goodness is vulnerable. It's vulnerable to, to sham, to deception, to trust that's misplaced. It's, it's, it is a precious thing, but it is very vulnerable. And I think that what an educated goodness can do is help to protect that vulnerability as it creates goodness by thinking about the conditions that sustain it, by preventing harm and error, and so on. Does that mean that the goodness that a person has isn't subject to moral luck or isn't, can't be undone by life's tragic events? No, I think it, it can happen. But it's a, it's a shot. It's a, it's a, it's a shot. It's an attempt to do it in a, in a, in a thoughtful way. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time. Uh, let us thank uh, the presenters.